Okay, good morning. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to come to this workshop. Um, what I'm going to discuss with you is experiments with a system which is certainly very small compared to the size of systems that are being discussed at this conference. I'm going to talk about experiments with trapped ions, with strings of trapped ions. And the system is not only small, it also has very few constituents. So I will ex present experiments with not more than, than 20 ions. And what I hope to show is that these ions constitute a quantum system which is extremely well controlled and which has long range interactions, of course. And, um, and that we can control the system in such a way that we can, for example, make ions behave as if they were interacting systems of, of spins. And so I will spend some time on explaining how we do this, and this will yeah, complement what, yeah, what you have heard already from Igor on Monday on these trapped ion systems. And then I will go on and present you some experiments where we can investigate then the, yeah, some non-equilibrium quantum dynamics in these systems. In particular, we can look at how quantum correlations spread in these systems, how we can understand this spreading in terms of spectroscopy of, of yeah, quasi-particles that we have in the system, and then finally, how, to, how we can maybe characterize quantum states that we create in the system by doing measurements in order to characterize the performance of, of these, these yeah, well-controlled quantum systems. Now, this is work which is which is done jointly in Innsbruck. So these are the, the people involved in the experiment, together with our theory colleagues, Philip Hauke and Peter Soller in Innsbruck. But it involves also collaboration with uh, people from the group led by Martin Plenio in, in Ulm when it comes to the characterization of quantum states that I want to discuss in the later part of my talk. And also, we had input from Andrew Daly from the University of Strathclyde. Now, the experiments that I want to present belong into the domain of what is called, yeah, quantum simulation that is the hope of having a well-controlled quantum system, an artificially engineered quantum system that um, we can control to the degree such that we might be able to learn something about the physics of quantum many body systems which are hard to simulate on a, on a computer. And there are a couple of such systems which, can, which are quite different. So there are, for example, experiments with also called atoms, there are trapped ion experiments, but then there are also solid state systems like, for example, quantum dot arrays or systems of superconducting qubits. Each of these systems has some interactions that can be some, yeah, that are natural to the system and therefore they might be used to investigate different, different physical models. What I want to focus on in my talk are trapped ions, which are well suited for, among others, simulating easing models. And so, um, what I want to, to show you is that we can realize a Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian of a, of a long-range transverse easing model where we have a spin-spin interaction term together with a, with a transverse magnetic field that competes with these spin-spin interactions, which in these spin-spin interactions have a, yeah, a long range and are described by, by a power law with a certain exponent alpha. There are a couple of yeah, different experimental systems which can be used to simulate such easing models. For example, yeah, we heard about Rydberg atoms yesterday. The Rydberg atoms in optical lattices are one candidate. There are also, yeah, also neutral atoms and molecules in optical lattices, or, for, or the laser-dressed trapped iron crystals that I want to discuss today. Um, now, um, there are, yeah, this is a slide just to illustrate what, yeah, yeah, what we are doing and what has been done. So these are the energy levels of a, of a six, six spin system and uh, where you see the energy as a function of the strength of the transverse field. These, yeah, the, the idea of using trapped ions for simulating transverse easing models has been, yeah, has been around for a couple of years, and um, many experiments that have been done initially in the, by, in the group led by Chris Monroe at the University of Maryland. And so many of these experiments have focused on the properties of, of the ground state, where people started preparing maybe the, the system in a, in a state which was easy pre to prepare and then adiabatically changed the parameters to go into a regime where the, the, the state starts to become interesting. What I want to discuss with you today is, the, is physics of, the, of, non yeah, of, of excited states here and in a regime where the, the, the transverse field here is considerably bigger than the spin-spin coupling. And so in that case, what you can see here is that the energy levels here fall into, yeah, fall into groups depending on whether you have either no spin excitation or one spin excitations, two spin excitations, and so on. And then the, 
the degeneracy of these levels here is then lifted by the the spin-spin interaction term that gives rise then to delocalized yeah to delocalization of these these excitations. And um, so what I want to show you is that um, yeah we can do experiments in this this first subspace where we have just one excitation in our system. This is nice because we can then we can easily understand the physics of what is going on there, and we can yeah. Look at what I want to show you is that we can look at the yeah, dynamics of of of, of, of yeah, correlations in our system and spectroscopically investigate these low lying excitations, and then I also want to show you experiments in a regime where the the complexity of the Hilbert space is much much bigger, where we have half of the ions in the excited state and half of the ions in the in the, in the lower state, and in these systems we have been looking into methods of to, to characterize the quantum states that are produced by the Ising dynamics. Now, um, yeah, clearly, the, when you have a system of trapped ions, the, the long-range interaction that we have at our disposition is a Coulomb interaction. And I already mentioned that this Coulomb interaction gives rise when you, when you, when you put ions into an external potential and cool these ions to, to low temperatures, gives rise to yeah, crystalline structures, so these, these Wigner crystals, where the ions repel each other due to the Coulomb interaction and then find equilibrium positions that, is, that are given by, a, by an equilibrium of forces of the neutral repulsion of the particles and the effect of the confining potential. Now, um, we make use of this Coulomb interaction for our experiments because what we, what we want to study are not the, the, the positions of the of these, these charges that we have in our trap, but we are rather interested in quantum states that we can encode in the internal levels of our, or the internal electronic levels of our ions. And therefore, what we are looking for are now interactions that somehow couple the internal state of, yeah, couple, couple the states of one ion to a state of another ion that is far away. And this is something we can, we can do by making use of the Coulomb interaction together with laser light that, that dresses this ion crystal. And so the, the basic idea behind this approach is, is quite easy to understand. Um, and this involves a transfer of momentum from the light field to the, to the ions. So when, when you think about, for example, for a, a free atom, yeah, think about a free atom, an atom that absorbs a, a photon um, yeah, obtains, is, obtains a momentum kick because it, it, starts to, it's, it carries the, the momentum of the photon. However, if the atom is initially in the excited state, then you have the opposite process and you have a stimulated emission process. And this process then, after the atom gets de-excited, you have two photons propagating in the same direction, and therefore the atom obtains a momentum kick into the opposite direction. So this creates spin-dependent forces, so the forces that depend on the internal state of the particle. And now, thanks to the Coulomb interaction, if one ion in this way obtains a momentum kick, then this momentum kick is somehow transferred to all of the other ions. And therefore, if there's a second absorption event on another ion, then somehow these, these, these phonons that arise to, by, the, by the Coulomb coupling of the ions can then give rise to an effective spin-spin interaction that involves only the internal degrees of freedom of the atom. I'll come, to the, come, come back to that later in a moment. Now, I told you we... What we need are and trapped ions, but also we need lasers to manipulate these ions. And for this reason, when you, when you look into the lab, there's, what you can see here is the ion trap apparatus in a, in a vacuum system here, but this takes only the smaller part, is only the smaller part of our experimental setup. The bigger part is occupied by lasers that we use for different purposes. So what we need are lasers in order to create ions in the first place in the trap. Then we make use of ions for cooling the particles to, to low temperatures, and we cool them such that we have to quantize the motion of the potential, uh, uh, have to quantize the, the motion of the ions in this external potential provided by the ion trap. Then, and we also make use of dissipative, dissipative processes to initialize the ions into a pure quantum state, in a pure electronic quantum state. Then we make use of ions for coherent excitation of the particles. So this is what is needed when we want to simulate these spin-spin interactions. And finally, the lasers, the lasers are important for detection measurements. And so this is when we, when we want to measure, do quantum measurements on the, on the ion state. Then once again, lasers are involved. Now, what about the timescales? So it takes about 
yeah, a few minutes in general to load an iron string into, this, into such, such a trap. What is nice is that these iron traps provide deep potentials and therefore we can store the ions for a long time, meaning that we can experiment typically with an iron string that we have loaded for a day without losing ions or having any other problems with it. And this time scale is long compared to the time scale of an individual experiment. So by an individual experiment, I mean that what we want to do is we want to initialize the ion, which involves laser cooling. We want to coherently manipulate them and in the end carry out a quantum measurement. This process takes about 20 milliseconds. And so if you, if you compare these two time scales, then you can easily conclude that on one day we can carry out something like 100,000 to a million quantum measurements. Now this sounds like, like a lot, but we also have to Keep in mind that when we do an, a measurement, a quantum measurement in our ion string, we get only very little information because a typical quantum measurement for us means that we want to figure out whether the ion is in its electronic ground state or whether it is in some excited metastable state. So per ion, we get one bit of information. And if we want to measure, for example, if we want to estimate an observable, it means that we have to do an experiment of this kind over and over again to get an estimation of the value of this expectation value. So I told you about time scales. Something, yeah. It's also interesting to think about length scales. So, so you have seen that this is a fluorescence picture of an of an iron string that we typically confine in traps which have oscillation frequencies of in the megahertz range. Now these oscillation frequencies set the equilibrium distance between the ions, and this means that the the, the biggest length scale in our experiment is the distance between a pair of ions, which is on the on the order of a few micrometers. Now, this is nice because it means that this is much bigger than the wavelengths of, of lasers that we use for manipulating the ions. And this is nice for two, two reasons. First of all, it enables us to spatially resolve the fluorescence of these ions when we image them on a CCD camera. So we can really look into, we can really see the individual components of our quantum system. And also it enables us to carry out experiments where we manipulate the quantum state of one ion using a strongly focused laser that does not interact with with the ions which are sitting next to the one that we want to manipulate. So this is from something we can do with, yeah, with, with strongly focused laser light. The, yeah, the bad side of these comparatively large distances are that the, the ion ion distance is much, much bigger than the natural length scale of our system, which is a Bohr radius. So there are no naturally occurring spin-spin interactions, for example, in, in our system on, on experimentally relevant time scales. So if we want to, to turn this ion crystal here into a quantum many-body system, we have to do it ourselves by the techniques that, that yeah, um, Igor already mentioned on, on Monday. But before coming to that problem, let me tell you about the ions that we use. We experiment with, with calcium, simply charged calcium-40 ions, which is an ion that is convenient for our purpose. And here I would just want to to, to look at the most relevant energy levels that we have. So, so a singly charged alkali earth atom here has one valence electron, and so it has a level structure that's similar to what you know about hydrogen. So we have an S1 half ground state, and this S1 half ground state can be, yeah, is, um, can be coupled to a state which you do not find in, in hydrogen, and this is a metastable state, a D5 half state, which can decay back only on, on an electric quadrupole transition, and for this reason it has a, a, a long lifetime, long on, on, yeah, for, for, on, for, for atomic physics experiments of about a second. And this lifetime is long compared to the duration of an individual experiment, and therefore we, we can forget it more or less about the, the finite lifetime of the state. Now, these two levels here are what we yeah, form what we call our, our spin one half system, or maybe I should call this a pseudo spin one half system because it's not has nothing to do with the electron spin of, of our, our ion. And so we have a, a two level system that we can ma manipulate now by a narrowband laser that couples these two transitions here. And <clears throat> we can then, for example, also measure the system by coupling the, 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 the S one half state to this short-lived P1 half state that you have here using a second laser. And if the ion gets excited to this upper level here, then the upper level can decay back only to the S1 half state, not to the other state. And therefore, if the ion is in the S1 half state, we can scatter millions of photons within one second. And therefore, we can, when we observe the, the fluorescence, we image the fluorescence onto a camera, we see that we have a bright ion in our trap. 
if on the other hand the ion is in the in this metastable state, it does not couple to the laser and therefore will not scatter any any photons and therefore appear as a dark spot on the on the camera. And so in this way we have a, a quantum state measurement capability that allows us to to detect models with unit efficiency, whether the ion is in, in one state or in the other state. If we are in a superposition state of the two, then this is a projective measurement which projects the ion onto either the ground state or onto the metastable state. So if you think about this as a, as a pseudo-spin system here, then we, it means that we identify the S1 half state with the spin down state, the, the D5 half state with the spin up state, and then that language then what we carry out here is a, a spin projection measurement along the z-axis of, of our, our block sphere. Now, we trap ions in a, in a linear trap, which I don't want to describe here in detail. Um, what is important is that this linear trap provides a harmonic trapping potential that we make very unisotropic in such a way that there's a weak axis here, so along which the ions will align, which has an oscillation frequency which is about 15 to 20 times weaker than the, the, the strong directions which confine the ions in the radial direction. And in these unisotropic potentials, the equilibrium positions of a small number of ions are then linear strings. And this is for, convenient for us because it means that we can then address ions in the way as I told you using focused laser beams. And, and so we get then, then pictures like this. We can spatially resolve the fluorescence of the ions using yeah, measurements where we detect the fluorescence for a few milliseconds. And that enables us to now to carry out quantum measurements on all of these ions, for example, what we can now do is, so this would be then the, the state where all the ions are the spin down state. We can then, for example, use a strongly focused laser beam to flip the ion here in the middle, the spin of the, in the middle, in which case then there, there seems to be an ion missing, it, but it's just an ion that does not emit fluorescence here. And in this way, we can then um, yeah, individually measure all the ions in our string. This strongly focused laser beam can also be quickly moved from one ion to a different location. And, and this is useful in the context of what I'm presenting to you today for two purposes. First of all, we can then, for example, engineer certain states, initial states, where certain ions are, are flipped. But we can also make use of this for measuring other quantities than the ones we can measure by a fluorescence measurement only. So I told you this fluorescence measurement corresponds to a spin projection measurement along the z-axis. Now, when we have this strongly focused laser beam, we can make use of this for coherently rotating our spin on the block sphere. And this means that, for example, when, you have, when we do not do these, measure, these, these rotations and we have measurements, then we can identify, for example, these pictures here with, with the, the quantum states that, that are sketched here. Now, what we can do is to have a coherent state rotation prior to the measurement. And this allows us to measure other spin projections as well. So, for example, if you, if you want to measure the z direction, I told you we have to project onto the eigenstates of this operator. If we want to measure, the, for example, the sigma x operator, and we want to project onto the x axis, we have some to find a way of projecting onto, onto the, the superpositions of the ground plus excited state and ground minus excited state, which, is, which can be done by coherently rotating these eigenstates using a laser pulse prior to the measurement. And in this way, we can then carry out by this. So this combination of a spin rotation followed by a fluorescence measurement corresponds then, for example, to a measurement of sigma x. And in that case, so, so for example, this picture here would then correspond to a measurement of, of population in, in this, this state here. And in this way, we can then have then the possibility of carrying out arbitrary spin correlation measurements that we are interested in. Now, how can we make the, the spins interact with each other? This is the, the, the big challenge in, in these experiments. So the Coulomb interaction gives rise to these equilibrium positions, but it also gives rise to the normal, the collective vibrational modes of the ions around these, these equilibrium positions. So this, would, this is the equivalent of, of phonons in, in a solid state. And um, we can now make so yeah we can now make use of these collective excitations. So this is an example of the center of mass mode of, of motion, which is not and this is not a, not a small excitation that we have here, but rather a very big one that in which the ion string was externally excited by by some electric field that that was resonant with the ion motion. 
another example here is this, this breathing mode in the longitudinal direction. Now we can make use of these modes in order to engineer our spin-spin interaction in the following way. So this is what I have shown you here, and I want to tell you now how we can, can achieve such an effective spin-spin interaction. So um, there are, if you have n ions in, your, in, in a linear string, you have n vibrational modes that describe the collective motion of the ion along the axis of the string, and then there are a set of, of n modes that describe the motion in one transverse direction, another set of motions in the other transverse direction. And when the potential is very unisotropic, it turns out that these, these collective modes that describe the ion motion in the transverse direction tend to bunch together in frequency space quite, quite, yeah, quite, quite well. And so what you can see here is, is um, a spectrum as we would measure it when we excite the ion on the on, on this internal transition between the electronic states as catched to you. So we can tune, if we tune the laser to, to a frequency such that it is resonant with the atomic transition, then we can excite the ion. But it turns out that we can also excite the ion if we tune the laser to a frequency which is equal to the atomic transition frequency plus or minus the frequency at which these collective modes of motion occur. And for the, these transverse modes of motion, you have here then one set of modes and what we can now do, and so, oh, sorry, this is, this is one example where we have an 18 ion crystal. You can see here that uh, here, the, if, you, if you count, you can see that there are 36 vibrational modes of, that describe the transverse ion motion and on, that, are, that can, be, yeah, can be seen in, in laser spectra and there's a second set on, on the lower frequency side of this, what we call carrier transition. Now, each of these resonances here corresponds now to a process where upon excitation of the ion from the lower state to the upper state, we also increase the vibrational quantum number in this particular mode by one unit, by one quantum of motion, or where we decrease it by one quantum of motion. Now, using laser cooling techniques, we can cool all these modes to the vibrational ground state. And in that case, what you see here is that the spectrum gets modified because now if we are in the emotional ground state, then there's no, no if, if, if n is equal zero, there's no corresponding state to which we could excite the, the ion on, on these red sideband transitions, whereas on the blue sideband, this is still possible. So what we do now is we make use of a laser that is bichromatic, so that carries two frequencies, and that is used to off-resonantly excite these vibrational modes that you see here in such a way that the sum of the two laser frequencies equals twice the atomic transition frequency. And what happens is the following. So imagine that you, have, that you just pick two ions here, which I assume to be both in the, the spin-down state, and where, the, where one of these vibrational modes is prepared in the, in the ground state of motion. Now, if, if one of these ions now absorbs a photon from this, this blue laser here, then its spin gets flipped, and the vibrational quantum number increases by one unit. This is what you see here. Now, if, in, if the other ion now absorbs also a photon, but this time from this, this red laser here, then its, its spin gets flipped as well, and the vibrational quantum number decreases again back to zero. And there's a similar process. And so you, so you see here, what we have done is now we have, we have flipped the, the two spins to the up, up state, and the vibrational state is again in the, in the ground state. There's a similar process that involves the spin-down, spin-up state, and that couples it to the spin-up, spin-down state. And it turns out that both of these processes have the same strength. So if you look at this, now this looks as an effective spin-spin interaction as you find it in the, in the easy model. Now this is what, what I get for a pair of ions. The question is now, what I, what I haven't shown you here is what is the coupling strength? And for this, we have to look into this, this vibrational mode structure and see what happens when, when we have a coupling that is mediated off resonantly by, by all of these modes here. So the idea is to have a, now a, a, so a, a process where we have, where we have a, a, a two-photon, two-ion process where the ions change its internal state mediated by these vibrational modes of motion of the ion crystal. Now, so this is a yeah, slightly busy slide, but don't, don't worry. So what I want to show you here is, um, let's maybe first concentrate on what is plotted here. So um, what I show you here is the, uh, the, how the coupling gets mediated by one of the modes, and this is the, the highest frequency mode, the center of mass mode, where all the ions move in sync with the same amplitude. 
So this, this movement is, is sketched here by, by the, the blue bars that tell you by how much the ion move and whether they move in phase or out of phase. And as all the ions move by the same amount, it turns out that the coupling strength that we get is the same for all ions. Because what matters here in this, in this formula, so here are the, these are the, 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 the spin-spin coupling constants. And, and I told you in second order perturbation theory, you can calculate now the strength of these spin-spin coupling constants. And it turns out what we have here is a, a sum over all vibrational modes. And what enters into the sum is now the product of these factors B i m, B j m, where i indicates which ion I'm looking at and m which mode I look at. And these factors are then the, the amount by, with which a certain ion participates in a certain collective mode of motion. And then and so, so we have these, these two amplitudes here. And then this gets divided by, by a term which more or less is the detuning of the laser from, the, from this resonance frequency that, that we're looking at. So if we have this center of mass mode of motion where all the ions move in sync, it means that this, all these coupling constants here are the same. And therefore, the spin-spin coupling is a, yeah, is, a, is a mean field coupling where each ion couples to each other ion with the same strength. And this is what you can see here. And this is this big matrix here, also in the, the small one. So here, the color indicates the strength and also whether the coupling is ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. In this case, we have an antiferromagnetic coupling, which is homogeneous when the, the coupling is mediated only by the center of mass mode. Now, what happens if we, if we pick the, 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 next, the next mode, which is uh, the tilt mode, where the ion crystal moves like this? In that case, we have now here a coupling which becomes inhomogeneous. And it turns out that you see here that ions which are close together, they, they move in, in sync. Ions which are at opposite end of the string, they move out of phase. And therefore, we have now a coupling that um, that is that, yeah, that reinforces the coupling of the center of mass mode if the ions are close together, and that is opposite to the coupling that is mediated by the center of mass mode if the ions are at opposite ends of the string. So here you see that in, in, for, for close ions, you have antiferromagnetic coupling. For ions that are far apart, you have ferromagnetic couplings. If you add up these two, you get what you see here in this, in this, this plot here. Now you can add more and more modes. So there's a, a next mode, and then in this, I think, yeah, there are 11 ions, I think. So if you add up all of those, then what you end up with here is a spin-spin coupling matrix, which, where you see that now the, the, the coupling strength decreases as a function of distance. So it falls off. We have now a coupling of finite range. And where the coupling is more or less homogeneous along the, the direction of the string. So we have more or less the same coupling for, for when it comes to nearest neighbor coupling or next to nearest neighbor coupling, so the, because the colors here are the same. And by, by playing now on the one hand side with the anisotropy of the potential, and on the, other hand, on the other hand with the laser detuning, we have now some control over the range of the interaction that we can engineer. Now, what does it look like? These are experiments with 15 ions where we looked at, at quantum quenches. So what we did is, and so, so here you, let's just look at the, the plot on the left-hand side. And so, so time goes upwards. What we measure is the magnetization of the ions, where the color encodes whether the ion is in spin down or spin up. And what you can see here is we flip the center ion, and then we have the spin-spin coupling, which gives rise to a hopping of excitations. And for this reason, this excitation starts to spread out as a, as a function of time, and then there are some interference patterns that develop. We can now change the, the range of the interaction. And so this was with a, with a, a so alpha here is the, 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 the exponent of this power law. And so we can go from, from yeah, long range to maybe even longer range. And, and what you see here is that, um, I don't know how well this can be seen, the, there are parts of the excitation which starts to spread out faster and faster. But on the other hand, the, the excitation also stays, the main part of the excitation also stays localized for a longer time. And this can be, so this behavior now can be understood in terms of, yeah, of, of quasi particles present in the system. And yeah, since this is a workshop about long range interactions, I think in principle I should, should spend more time on talking about this because this is what where the long range character of the interaction comes in. But on the, on the other hand, I have to hope that Michael Fosfeig, who was involved in experiment at, at JQI Maryland, which I published in this companion paper, um, will have some time to talk about this. and. And so I rely on him to, to say more about the this, this spreading of, of these excitations. Now we can do more than just look at the magnetization. 
we can also look at the spreading of quantum correlations. So, so because from, from measurements here, it is in principle not clear whether this, yeah, these are really quantum correlations that we, that we see here propagating. And for this, we have done experiment in a smaller system with only seven ions, but the same type of system. But now what we do, instead of just measuring the spin projections along the z direction, what we can do is now we can pick, for example, a pair of ions, let's say the ion which is to the left and to the right of this initially flipped ion, and then evolve the system for a certain amount of time and then carry out measurements and carry, measure all kinds of spin correlations between these ions. And when we have these measurements, we're able to reconstruct the density matrix of the, this reduced, so the reduced two particle density matrix that you can see here, for example, for a time of nine milliseconds. This is a real part of the density matrix, and you can see here what, what, is, what, the, what this tells you is, so there, there are elements here which tell you that either the excitation is residing in one ion or in the other ion, or in the rest of the system that is not the two ions we're looking at. But in addition to that, you see that we have also off diagonal elements, which tells you that we have here a coherence of a position between the ion being on the left side and on the right side. And from this measured density matrix, we can then measure how much entanglement we have in the system. This, is, this can be described by the concurrence. And when you do this now for different ions and for different amounts of times, you get the curves you can see here, which shows you that so this, is this, this amount of entanglement that we have between the, these pairs of ions, we see that the neighboring ions get entangled, then get disentangled again, and then the entanglement moves to the next to nearest neighbors, two and six, and then to the, to the ions which are at the edges of our ion crystal. Now, this spreading of correlations can be understood in terms of quasi-particles propagating in the system, and the question is whether we can whether we can do spectroscopy of, of these quasi-particles which are, which are spin waves in our system. Now, <clears throat> for this, we can carry out a, yeah, a Ramsey experiment, a many-body Ramsey experiment. In a Ramsey experiment, with a single particle, what you do is you have a pi over two pulse, that is, you, you flip your spin, then you switch on your interaction. If now the energy of, your, of, of the two levels does not coincide with the frequency or with the energy of, of, of your of your the system coupling the two levels, then the, you will see in a, that the Bloch vector will start to rotate, and this is something you can detect using a, a second pi over two pulse by carrying out a spin projection in the equatorial plane. Now, when you have when we when you do this now with with a string of ions, where we flip one of the ions and switch on then this easing interaction, it means that now this localized excitation has to be written in terms of the delocalized excitations, of which are the eigenstates of our system here. And so now we have, now this means that we have here a superposition of eigenstates, and since these have different energies, this is at the basis of what makes these excitations hop here. So that when we then carry out the second pi over two pulse here, we measure, um, we can measure a magnetization that, that changes as a function of the, 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 the time during which we have this easing interaction switched on. And in this way, we get then a signal which tells us about the, gives us information about the, the energy separation between these energy levels that are occupied here from the ground state. Now, this is a bit difficult if we populate more than one of these levels here, because at the moment our resolution is not, not good enough to resolve all of them. But what we can do is we can try to create a superposition of the ions in the ground state and in one of these, these quasi-particle excitation states. And when we do this and measure then now these, these magnetizations here along different axes and combine the signals in a suitable way, then we get here a signal that we can Fourier transform. And from the Fourier transformation, we see that in this case, this state here is shifted downwards by the spin-spin interaction and by, by a certain amount. If we do the same with some other state, we see an upward shift. This tell, can, from this, we can infer that we have indeed antiferromagnetic interactions. And in principle, it would be nice if we could carry out a spectroscopy of all these levels in this way. Now, the resolution in our system at the moment is, is limited by the coherence time that we have. For this reason, we turned to a slightly different technique. That is, we thought it would be nice if we could measure the energy level differences between two such states here, where we have, for technical reasons, much longer coherence times. And for this, we then create a state which is roughly a superposition of the ground state, two of these states here, and then some higher higher excitation that we don't have to care about. 
when we time evolve our system now under the easing interaction, then these two states have different energies, and therefore we get they will acquire different phase factors here. And then in the end, we can carry out a projective measurement here of the this and measure measure the spin projection in, in the z direction this time, and then we get pictures like this. Now the 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 easing interaction conserves in the limit in which we are the number of excitations in our system. And therefore, what we can do is we can now, now post-select only those measurements where we have the right number of excitations present. In this way, we can more or less yeah, get rid of population which is here and in these higher excited states. And, this is, and in this way, we have a signal which, is, which we would have obtained had we initially prepared the ions in the position of these two states here. Now, doing this measurement here, we get experimental data, which now shows oscillation at a single frequency, which match quite well the, the, the simulations that we carry out. When you do a Fourier transform of this data here and do this for different superposition of states, then we find indeed that we have here, that we, have, um, that we can measure the energy separation between these different quasi-particle states, and in this way we construct a, yeah, the, the, the dispersion relation that we have. I don't have time to talk about this, but we can also, in this way, look at interactions between causal particles and, and show that, there are, that these causal particles do interact in our, in our system. Now, coming to the, the last part here, I want to show you that we can also do experiments in a domain where the system is much more complex, because when you have a single excitation, you have, even if you have n ions, your, the, the relevant state space is only n-dimensional, so it's still a very, very simple quantum system. When you have n ions and half of them are in the excited state, and this, subsp this, subspace, this subspace grows exponentially with the size of the system, and therefore it's much harder to, yeah, to, to analyze what is going on in, in such a subspace. And so what we have done is to do similar experiments, starting by in a, a nail-like state where every second ion was, was flipped, and then we switched on this interaction, and then you see that, yeah, some, some hopping of excitations, and at some point then it becomes hard to, 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 to say what, what is going on. And um, what we would like to do is to understand in a bit better which kind of quantum states that we, uh, which, yeah, which kind of quantum states are produced under this dynamics. So what we can of course do is we can do what I already showed you. We can look at, at measurements on subsystems, that is we can carry out quantum tomography, for example, of pairs of neighboring ions. When we do this, we measure all kinds of correlation functions. We reconstruct density mat reduced density matrices, and that tells us, for example, that now after a certain amount of interaction time, all the ions become entangled and then become disentangled again. <clears throat> but it does not tell us anything about the, the global state of our quantum system. Now, the global state of our quantum system can, in principle, be reconstructed using yeah, quantum state tomography methods. However, um, the, the number of measurements that would be required to measure the density matrix of such a 20 iron system is, is, is huge and it's clearly out of question to, to carry out such experiments. This has been done, this is something we have done in the past with up to eight particles, but even with eight particles you need something like close to 10,000 different measurement bases, and so it involves lots of measurements, and since the number of measurements grows exponentially, we cannot certainly do this with, with, with more than, let's say, eight or maybe 10 particles. So. Um, what we have done instead was to do a kind of quantum state tomography. This was in collaboration with our, yeah, our collaborators from Ulm, where we, um, where we say now um, we have a state which is special in the way that initially the ions are, are in a product state, and then we switch on the interactions. We have long-range interactions, but nevertheless, ions tend to, to couple much more strongly, to talk much more strongly to their neighbors than to ions which are far apart. And based on this assumption, it is reasonable to assume that now, the, that now these, these entangling interactions produce some, yeah, produce correlations, but these correlations should be mostly local. And under these assumptions, um, there is a hope that we can make use of, of parametrizations of the quantum state, which, which come under the name of matrix product states, which might efficiently capture these correlations, and which are, yeah, which are, mm, a much more compact way of, of describing the quantum state than, than by, by the, the full quantum state. And so the, the idea is that what we can try to do is when we evolve our system under the easing interaction, that we now carry out measurements of quantum correlations, for example, of, of triplets of spins, which might capture the correlations that we have in our system. And then based on these measured correlations, now we try to, to find the matrix product state which best represents our system. 
this is certainly an approximation because here we represent our system by a pure quantum state. We know that our system is not in a pure state. Every experimental system is in a mixed state. And, but nevertheless, it might be an approach to, to learn something about the state. So, so what we do is we have these quantum correlations here. We have our first data set that we use for, for reconstructing such a matrix product state. And then in a the second step, we have additional measurements that we can then use in order to, 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 yeah, to, to bound the, to, to, to learn something about the state that we have in our, in our lab. I think given the time, I will not say much more about this. So, so what you can see here are now measurements where we evolve the system, in this, in this case, eight ions for variable amounts of times. And the, the upper trace here is, so this is a small system where we can easily calculate the quantum state that we expect to find. And then we can compare now our reconstructed quantum state here with the exact quantum state. And the, we have checked numerically that this, now this reconstructed matrix product state should be a very good representation of our state. So, so if the, there's a deviation from, if these two do not match perfectly, this is not because we have limited ourselves to a reduced set of states, but rather because we have some experimental imperfections which give rise to, to a reduction of this, this fidelity that you can see here. Now, but on the other hand, if we, if we have a curve like this, then we, 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 well, we reconstruct a state, and we can say how close it is to the state that we expect it to be, but we do not, yeah, it's not clear what we learn about the state that we have experimentally produced, because we know that this state is not what we have in our experiment. And so, for this reason, it's also interesting to, to ask, is it possible, given such a reconstructed state, that by doing additional measurements, that we can now put bounds on how close our, our experiment is to this reconstructed state, which is, in principle, which could be also useful, given that maybe, it turned, maybe we have the, the, the wrong, wrong theory assumptions, so maybe we, we believe that we, have, we should have this state, but in fact, we have some control parameters which are different, and therefore, we, it, it's slightly different. But um, what you can see here are now, now bounds that we find. And it turns out that when, we, when you look only at, at yeah, it, it, yeah we, these are bounds that are based on looking at correlations of, of one, two, or three spins. So it needs at least three spins in order to, to get a bound. But on the other hand, these bounds tend to become quite, quite weak after short interaction times, which is a bit disappointing. Now, um, we have, I don't have the time to, to, to talk about this, I believe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in this, I would suggest that you come to me and I'll show you then the data we have here. So this gets worse if we have 14 ions. Now, um, we can do something in addition to that, that is we can try to carry out a direct fidelity estimate measurement of between our state in, in, the exp in our experiment and this reconstructed state. This is also a task which becomes exponentially difficult when you have large systems, but there are techniques of, of doing this, and we have done this with 14 ions. You see that, that this gives now values which are yeah, much closer to what we, what we hope to find from this, this simple matrix product state re reconstruction process. Yeah, so this is what I, what I hope to show you. I skip over this, so we have, we measure complex, yeah, long Pauli strings and make use of this to reconstruct this, this state. And so to, to summarize, I hope you have seen that, that ions are indeed a well-controlled quantum system that can be used for realizing these, investigating these long-range easing models and that we can yeah, carry out measurements along the lines I have, have told you. So it will certainly be a challenge to go to larger number of ions because so far we are in a regime where we can still understand everything from our can calculate everything in principle. If we could go to 50 ions and this would, the situation would change, then it would not be possible to do exact simulations of the, the, the states that we should produce. Also, creating higher coupling strings and lowering the decreance in our system is, is a concern we have. And then what is also interesting is to see which kinds of interactions which are not only long-range easing interactions can be produced in our, our system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.